Thank you for responding in all of these different ways for communion. to let you know a little bit where we are headed. We have a few more weeks in Ecclesiastes. At the beginning of April, we're diving into a study on the New Testament book of Colossians, and so we will be having some study books uh, available soon for that study, and so we will be immersing ourselves in Colossians for several weeks. So I'm excited about that study, um, but I'm excited for the remaining weeks that we have in Ecclesiastes. So if you look ahead in your Bible, you will note there's 12 chapters in Ecclesiastes. We've been taking one chapter a week, so you can see when the end is coming with Ecclesiastes. Some of you may be exceptionally excited about that. Um, perhaps not. But one of the things that I have noted as I've been talking to people is uh, the depth of thinking and the depth of interaction with Ecclesiastes and how much is tucked into these verses when we actually take the time and our discipline to work through it. It's not the easiest of books, and yet it's in the Bible for many reasons, and we've been discovering some of those along the way. This morning, we're going to be focusing in on three gifts from God, three gifts from God, Ecclesiastes 9, primarily verses 1 through 10 is going to be the focus of our text. Several years ago, I was in a local gas station convenience store. I ran into a friend of mine who is a local business owner, and we were just talking. I was getting ready to purchase something, and he came up to me with one of these little cards, and he said, do you have one of these? And I said, no, I don't have one of those. What is that? And he said, it's just a card, and he just left it at that and gave it to me. So I didn't really know what it was at the time, but I knew it was from this particular store where we were talking, and it had a little barcode on the back. And so it didn't take me long to realize that this is a, a free coffee barcode little thing. And this particular friend that I was talking to did not realize my passion for coffee at the time, but this is one of those gifts in life that is so very small, seemingly insignificant, and yet every time I go to this particular store and use this barcode and get yet another cup of coffee, I'm reminded of my interaction with my friend and I'm reminded of his generosity and his just almost offhand comment, hey, do you have one of these? And it's truly been one of those gifts that has kept on giving literally over the years. And I wish I would have kept track over the years how much money this little card has saved me on coffee because the prices, everything is going up, right? Including coffee. So I'm thankful for those, that little gift. As you think about your life, think about all of the gifts that you've received over the course of your life. Maybe you can pinpoint a gift or two that just blew your mind. Maybe it was something great, or maybe it was something kind of small like this, but that you discovered later on that, oh, that's just a really kind of convenient, handy, generous gift that this person gave me. One of the things that we're going to note this morning is that our God is oh so generous, and we've experienced some of that through this meal, right? But there's some things in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 that are going to challenge us to refocus our lives on all of the gifts that God has given us and continues to give us each day. And maybe you had a week where you were tempted to focus on the one or two things that were really challenging, really difficult, and in fact, they were really challenging and really difficult. But your vision suddenly started to get pretty tunnel-like in its nature. God wants our vision to be expanded this morning, and it's going to emerge from his word because the word of God refocuses us, right? The word of God transforms our minds and changes our thinking. And so on a regular basis, not only do we need to uh, confess our sins and keep that short account with God with our sins, but we also need to keep that short account with God in regard to our lives and the circumstances that we are seeing happen in the world, but also that we experience in our own lives. And so we're going to look at three powerful gifts. As great as this free coffee card is, right? Uh, the gifts of God are infinitely greater. And so... The gifts in your life that maybe you have a tendency to, to focus in on and really are thankful for, which is a good thing. God wants to focus our vision on his gifts and specifically what are going to emerge from the text this morning. So here we go. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. As I mentioned, we're going to be focusing in on 1 through 10. 
And what I'm going to do this morning, for those of you who are type A, you're going to love me. I'm going to give you the point. We're going to go to the Bible, right? And here we go. Point number one, gift number one. Your gift number one from this text is hope in the face of death. It's hope in the face of death. Solomon writes in verse one, so I reflected on all of this. I'm going to stop right there. God desires for us to be reflective people. And we've looked at this in the context of wisdom. Jesus Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. If you and I are going to live wisely in this world, we have to be people who are reflective. Remember, we don't make decisions based on uh, knee-jerk reactions. We are called to be people who are patient, who are thoughtful, who are prayerful, and who are reflective. When we have big decisions to make, we pray through those. We, we consult the Lord. We are asked also in Proverbs to consult other people who are wise to get feedback from folks. And so we gather information from the Lord and from others, and we reflect, and we make these prayerful decisions. And so Solomon begins this chapter by saying, so I reflected on all of this, stuff that's come before. In his search for meaning, he was looking at all of these different things in life, and he was realizing that it was God, his creator, who alone could provide this meaning and significance that he was truly looking for. It's a little sermonette on the first few words of chapter 9. Here we go. So I reflect on all this and conclude that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. He's sovereign, right? He's over it all. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny. If you write in your Bible, which I would encourage you to do, I would write death in the margin. The common destiny that you have with the person sitting next to you is death. The common destiny that you have with your neighbor across the street is death. And so it's one of those themes. It's a thematic thread of Ecclesiastes of living in light of our death. And so he's reflecting on this. And he's saying, everyone in this room, everyone on planet Earth shares this common destiny. The righteous... And the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. No one escapes this, all right? As it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. A few weeks ago, we looked at this issue of taking oaths. In the context of Old Testament worship, that was a part of Israelite worship sometimes, was to make an oath to God. And remember how we discovered that it was often made during a time of crisis, a time of weakness, of saying, Lord, if you get me out of this pit and hear my prayer and answer my prayer, I will do this, that, or the other. So Solomon is simply saying in this part of the text, some make oaths in their worship, some don't make oaths in their worship. He's laying a case for the simple reality that everybody's going to experience death. Verse 3. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes them all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. Interesting line. We'll get that, to that in a minute. As you read the Old Testament, as you read Ecclesiastes, there's one thing that you need to know. There's a word that appears in some translations. It's the word sheol, which is used in different ways, but it's a place of darkness. It's a place of gloom, and sheol is often used to describe the place where dead people go. Now, as you read through the Old Testament, there's these glimpses. Every so often you'll see these glimpses of a resurrection. But we are blessed to live in a time when we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. We are blessed to live in a time when this meal is a looking back meal on the sacrifice of Jesus, and it's a looking forward meal to his second coming. So people in Old Testament times who were still under the sacrificial system didn't have the opportunity or the privilege to celebrate the fulfillment 
of the sacrificial system, who is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. And so in the Old Testament, there's this word shield, the grave, darkness, a place of gloom. But like I said, there's these glimpses. Listen to one glimpse. If you want to write it down, Psalm 49, verse 15. But God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. That's like a window in the Old Testament to resurrection. I've been reading through Job this past week and being amazed at the connections between Job and Ecclesiastes. If you would like to participate in that, I would encourage that. Read through Job and think about it through the lens of Ecclesiastes. It's amazing all the different connections. So I'm reading through Job. It's a challenging book. Here's a man who's suffering incredibly. And scripture says that he was an upright man walking with the Lord and all of this terrible stuff happened to him. In Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, right after he talks a lot about his suffering, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. That's a window in Job of the resurrection. We have the fullness of the story. We can read about Jesus' resurrection. And so if Job has this window, and in the midst of his sorrow and difficulty and discouragement, he can say, I know that my Redeemer lives. How much more those who live on this side of the empty tomb on our deepest, darkest days, when we have the most discouraging moments of our lives, can say, you know what? This is really hard. But I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will stand on the earth. And then Job even gives this intimation of the physical resurrection of the body, which we will experience when Christ returns. It's amazing. Absolutely powerful. And so we can live in hope in the face of death. What I read in Ecclesiastes, it's tough sledding. Everybody's gonna die, but there's windows. You have to see these windows. There's grace in the gloom. There's windows in this preponderance of death. Look at verse three again. We have to see this. He says, this is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. We got to this with communion. Many of you wrote this on your cards. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We are ungodly people, right? In need of redemption and saving. And thankfully in Christ, we have that. But Solomon wants to make it very clear that this evil manifests itself in death. Paul said it this way in Romans 6. 23. The wages or the penalty of sin is death, right? We focus mostly on sin this morning for this meal. But we should never focus exclusively on sin because the cross wasn't just for our sin. The cross was also for our death. And so we also can't separate this from the empty tomb. Because if Jesus didn't rise, we wouldn't be here this morning. This would be a waste of time. We would all be fools. But Jesus did die. He did rise again, which means that we not only have the possibility of forgiveness of sin, but we have the hope of resurrection. Because Jesus rose as the first fruit of resurrection. And we will have our own resurrection in time. One scholar put it this way. His name is Ray Anderson. It is not just the sin that needs to be forgiven, but death that needs to be overcome. So when you can respond in your little sheets that you are not fearing death, that is powerful. 
And that is testimony to the fact that Christ dwells within you. The same power that rose Jesus Christ from the grave dwells within me and dwells within you. And so perfect love casts out all fear. We do not need to fear anything in this world, including death. The scholar goes on to say the consequence of sin is death. And the great human dilemma is death, not merely sin. The cross must be viewed backward through the resurrection. Only with the resurrection of Jesus can the claim of Jesus to be the Son of God be verified. And so, in verse 4 of Ecclesiastes 9, Solomon writes these words, Anyone who is among the living has hope. You are breathing this morning. You have hope because those of you who are in Christ, you have hope. Because Christ is the hope of glory. If you are not yet in Christ, if you have not put your trust in Jesus as Savior, you have hope this morning, according to Solomon, because you are still breathing and you are listening to the Word of God. And as I mentioned earlier, just like I told that group of young people on Wednesday, today is the day. I'm telling you this morning, yet again, today is the day. Another way of putting this is, what in the world would anyone be waiting for? Why would we reject this good news of God choosing to take flesh upon himself and become flesh for us and to die in our place? What would we be waiting for? Anyone who is among the living has hope. And then, I know we've got a lot of dog lovers in the house this morning, which is great, but I'm going to tell you this. In the ancient world, dogs were on the lowest rung of the animal totem pole or spectrum, right? Now we love our dogs. Um, I think if you go to Starbucks with your dog, they give you like a puppuccino or something like that. In the ancient world, that wouldn't have happened, all right? But he says this, even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. Lion in the ancient world, sitting pretty at the top or near the top of the animal totem pole. Lion at the top, dog at the bottom. Thus the phrase. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. Because we have breath, right? To praise a king. We have breath, right? To share good news with people around us. We have breath this morning, right? To proclaim Jesus, perhaps, for the very first time. We are given the gift of hope in the face of death. There's going to be a picture of a theologian on the screen. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was hanged on April 9th, 1945 in a concentration camp in Flossenburg. When he was in prison, he led worship services with other prisoners. And one person wrote about these experiences. And during one of these worship services, one person wrote, he had hardly ended his last prayer. When the door opened, to their meeting space and two people walked in and they said, prisoner Bonhoeffer, come with us. And the person writes that that only had one meeting for all the prisoners. They were going to be led to the gallows. So the group said goodbye to Bonhoeffer and Bonhoeffer took this one person aside and Bonhoeffer said, this is the end, but for me, it is the beginning of life. This is the end, but for me, it is the beginning of life. And so for those who love Jesus, for those who follow Jesus, we see that death is not the end, but the beginning of life in many ways. And so Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, with kind of a small resurrection theology, moves us to the cross and the empty tomb, and here we are today, with a more full resurrection theology where we can say with Bonhoeffer, when we meet our day of death, this is the end, but for me, it's the beginning of life. Gift number two, are you ready? Here we go. It's joy. 
in the simple rhythms of life. Joy in the simple rhythms of life. Look at verses 7 through 9 of Ecclesiastes 9. Solomon says, go, eat your food with gladness. Drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labor under the sun. He says, go, get yourself a good dinner, enjoy a good meal, enjoy some good beverage, enjoy some good company, take your wife out on a date. Joy in the simple rhythms of life. Sometimes we think, you know what, I want to do something great for God today or with my life. And we need to be brought back to the realization that in God's kingdom, right, seemingly small things are really great things. Mustard seeds grow into huge bushes. And so this week, I want you to think in terms of small and powerful. I want you to think in terms of intentional and joyful. I want you to think about the rhythms of your life, the coming and going from your house, the sitting down at table and getting up from table. The driving to work and the driving home from work. And how can you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, interject intentionality into those rhythms of life so that you can experience joy? If you are married, I want to challenge you to go on a date this week with your spouse. If you're not married, I want to challenge you to go on a, an outing with a friend or a group of friends. And you even initiate it. Get some people together. Go have some good conversation. Go have a party and enjoy the blessing of life and friendship and food. Because there's a part of Ecclesiastes that is just this. Let me just say this. Life can be hard. God is faithful with his grace. Life can be short. We're going to die. So can we please maximize the moments of each day, giving thanks to him for our life and breath and the food on the table and the friends that we have around us and bring glory to him through the simple things of life. And so as I look back at my life, I've wasted a lot of time thinking about all the great things that I want to do for God. And right in front of me are what? People. Right in front of me is what? A table with some food. People, food, and the blessing of God's presence in the midst of all of that. And so maybe if you think about your life maybe over the last month, you're like, wow, it's just been this bit of a rat race in terms of not even really thinking about what's going on in my life. Moving from point A to point B, my life is a little bit like autopilot. What are the first few words of Ecclesiastes chapter 9? So I reflected on all this. Nothing changes in our lives without reflection and prayer. Um, I don't want to live my life on autopilot. It's really easy to kind of start going in that direction. I don't think you do either, but it's really easy to start going in that direction. And so how can we live this week in tune with the Spirit, thankful to the Lord for the blessings before us. And to think about rejoicing in his presence, rejoicing for these small gifts, and being truly thankful. I'm reading a book on Ecclesiastes, and the author told a story about a conversation that he had with his grandparents. And I just like to read it because I think this is hitting home to what I'm trying to communicate. The author's name is Zach Eswine, and he says, My grandpa and grandma on my dad's side live in Camden, Tennessee. This little country town isn't far from the town of Bucksnort. I've never been to Bucksnort, Tennessee, but evidently it's a thing. In that unknown place, they make a life, including expressing their love for Jesus through a little local church. 
In their mid to late 80s, I spoke to them on the telephone. They had just gone fishing and were cleaning the 26 fish that they had caught that day. How are you doing? I asked my grandpa. Well, we got up this morning. It was a good day, he said. Um, maybe my nervous laugh and then my quiet caused him to feel that he should explain what he meant. Zach, when your grandmother and I wake up, we just give thanks to God. Because at our age, waking up is not a promise. Then we have the strength to do what we had planned to do that day. We give thanks to God again that we had the strength to do it. Because at our age, strength and health comes and goes. If we get a nap in and we wake up, man, we give thanks. If it's dinner time and we're sitting down to eat, we give thanks. Not only for our food, but also that we can eat it. And that we made it through that day that far. After that, when we go to bed at night, we look at each other, and then we look back on the day, and we thank God for another day that he gave us to live. So today we went fishing, and what do you know? We got 26 fish. The good Lord must still have a purpose for us. And that was his conversation with his grandparents. That is Ecclesiastes. Exactly. I'm breathing. God's blessed me. He has more for me to do in my life. You have breath. God loves you. He's going to open up doors this week that you don't even know about right now. And he's just going to ask you to listen for his voice, and you're going to walk through those doors, and he's going to bless you and others as a result of it. Joy in the midst of the rhythms, rhythms of this life. Gift number three is simply the strength. Strength to serve God and others. Look at verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Why? For in the realm of the dead, where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. What I exhorted the young people on Wednesday, and what I'm exhorting you, flows out of this. Solomon is saying, time is short. God has given us gifts, skills, talents, strength. Use it. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it. Here's the problem. Sometimes I don't feel very strong. Sometimes I get tired. You got tired this week. Some of you took some long naps because you were so tired. So sometimes we get so tired, we wonder, wow, can I really still do anything? And then I put this passage on the bottom of your bulletin because I think it's so powerful and it's worth reflecting on for a moment. This is the Apostle Paul, who was beaten, whipped, imprisoned, shipwrecked. He got tired, beat up. Pretty sure there were many days when Paul took a long nap in the middle of the day because he couldn't press further that day. He said, he is the one we proclaim talking about Jesus, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. It's cool that there's even a connection. Wisdom, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Job. So that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And then look what he says. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Here's one of those powerful commingling passages. Was it my strength or Christ's strength? Yes. <laughs> yes. The Bible never solves these dilemmas. Yes. So when you're tired this week, 
You pray, Jesus, to the, your spirit, give me power to accomplish the work that you have for me to accomplish. Paul's goal was to present everyone as full, fully mature in Christ. In other words, your role as a parent this week is to do all within your power and the power of Christ, who so powerfully works within you, to work towards presenting your child mature in Jesus. It's discipleship. We're called to do this with other relationships that we have as well. Help our spouses look to Jesus. Help our friends look to Jesus. Help our coworkers work to Jesus. I've done many funerals here over the years. And one of the bittersweet aspects is reflecting on the lives of saints, right? Who I have known quite well, you've known many of them very well as well. But to see how this actually plays out in people's lives. People who get tired, yet are empowered by Christ. People who get weary, but don't stop because of the working of God's Spirit in their lives. We had a funeral here a few years ago, and the only song that I could kind of find that captured this sense of how God does this is a song called, Yet Not I, But Through Christ In Me. I want you to think about some of these words as I read these as a Closing thought. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, my freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. One more verse. This is Ecclesiastes-ish. The night is dark. You're going to have some dark moments this week in your life because that's how life is. And that's why Ecclesiastes is in the Bible. We have to deal with reality. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Whatever your hands finds for you to do this week Solomon and the Lord through the word says do it with all your might and with the power of Christ flowing in and through you and he will carry you in his grace that's good news would you bow with me do you need hope this morning for any circumstance in your life. If one of the gifts of God is hope, would you just say, Lord, you know the dark that I'm walking through. I need you to infuse my heart with hope. Who needs joy? An experience of joy this week in the midst of simple rhythms of life. Would you just ask Jesus to help you be intentional about living reflectively, and living intentionally to be truly thankful for your family, for your friends, for your church family, for the food that you will eat. And do you need strength? Strength way beyond your own. It's the strength of the risen Savior who stands among us victorious with scars on his hands and on his feet. the Lamb, who has conquered not only our sin, but also death. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us hope, joy, 
strength today. Because we are alive and we have a mission. So may we be faithful to hear your words this week and to just obey as you lead us out into the world to be the light in the darkness. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you